This is The Red Line, where we interview three big geopolitical experts on one big subject shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. I can't think of a country more destined for conflict than the nation of Iraq. I don't think there's a single country in the world that has more triggers in it for both regional and civil conflicts. The modern borders of Iraq were drawn by the British and French during the height of the First World War, when Paris and London were carving up a post-Ottoman Middle East. The borders drawn were incredibly unrepresentative of the situation on the ground, with Iraq representing everyone from Shias to Sunnis to Yazidis to Christians and even Kurds. But it was the 1910s, and the British and French weren't really known for logical decisions at the time when it came to their colonial assets. Right now as it stands, Iraq sits around two major rivers, which flow out to a tiny 20 km wide coastline. The west is majority Sunni, and would probably look towards Riyadh for religious guidance. The east, where the majority of the population lives, a majority Shia, and would probably look towards Tehran for religious guidance. To complicate things as well, we also have a third country inside of it, being the autonomous region of Kurdistan, who have for the most part a pretty large anomaly for the region, being highly democratic and focusing on things like voting rights and women's rights. The Kurds have been the US's most trusted ally in the region and are usually the pointy end of the spear in most Middle East operations. But their dream of a Kurdish homeland means going to war with Iran, Armenia, Turkey, Syria and Iraq just for starters. Although, we'll talk more about this a bit later. With a huge oversimplification, when I look at the Middle East today, I can see four major poles of foreign power. There's one pole in Riyadh, which helms quite a lot of the Gulf states and the religious monarchies in the region. There's a pole in Jerusalem, which often acts as the United States' foothold in the region. There's one in Ankara, the capital of Turkey, which has quickly stepped up to the main stage, now being a major player both diplomatically, like in Syria and Lebanon, or militarily, like in Azerbaijan or Libya. These days, it's pretty hard to have a conversation about the Middle East without also bringing Turkey into that equation. The fourth pole is the one that's been butting heads with Saudi Arabia for years now, and that's the one in Tehran, the center of Shia Islam. Tehran has influence through everything from political parties like Hezbollah in Lebanon through to Houthi fighters in Yemen. The overall goal for Tehran is often stated to be to create a Shia crescent to the sea, a corridor stretching from the borders of Pakistan all the way to the Mediterranean. Now take a second to step back and think about a map of the Middle East and plot out those cities, Ankara, Tehran, Riyadh and Jerusalem. And in the middle of all four of them is Iraq. Iraq could project into all of the other ones, which means Iraq is not only a powder keg for civil war, but also the first line of intervention for all of these powers around them. The US intervention, the mission accomplished, was supposed to solve this, making a strong democracy in the Middle East to buttress against these others. But did it really work? <sighs> Not really. We ended up with an even worse civil war. ISIS, Al-Qaeda, a growing Iran, a more militant Saudi Arabia, and the entire region now becoming a black hole for international conflicts. So what went wrong? Why did this situation turn out so badly? And will it get worse? What can be done to try and bring a stable middle ground between these major players in the Middle East? Well, this week we try and answer the question, what went wrong in Iraq? And how did we get here? And to help us go through the history of what brought us to this point, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. Mission Accomplished It is, in, in many ways, um, three different countries, um, three different uh, competing regions. Uh, Kurdish region to the, uh, to the northwestern uh, portion of the country. It's a fairly autonomous region. Uh, it's 85% um, uh, Sunni. Uh, of course, the Kurdish portion of the country is part of a larger uh, non-sovereign Kurdistan divided between Syria, Iran, uh, Turkey, 
You have the Sunni area, which would be in the northwestern portion of the country, often referred to as the Sunni Triangle. If you have a map in front of you, you can literally draw a, a triangle and get the outlines of the region. And then the southeastern corner, you have uh, Baghdad, of course, the, the capital of Iraq, where much of the uh, fighting between uh, Sunnis and, and Shiites took place. In the southern part of the country, you have um, a Shiite-dominated um, uh, area. The Shiite areas were fairly uh, stable during the, uh, the Civil War. Uh, much of the fighting took place um, in the uh, Anbar region uh, within the Sunni Triangle in the northwest and in the belts around Baghdad itself and, of course, in Baghdad itself, where you had mixed Sunni-Shiite uh, neighborhoods. And, of course, that was a situation that was uh, ripe for uh, conflict. James Leverbeek is a professor of political science and international affairs at George Washington University. He was also the chair of the International Security Studies section of the International Study Association. James, though, has written a number of books focusing on Iraq, including Planning to Fail and the Limits of the U.S. Military Capability. He joins us today. Uh, when you are in the minority, you need to, to dominate uh, the majority uh, in order to retain power. Uh, that is the, the dynamic that, that's uh, occurred in, in Syria with the uh, Assad regime, although there you have an Alawite uh, minority, uh, a Shia, uh, dominating the Sunni majority. In the case of Iraq, it's it's just the opposite. Uh, Saddam Hussein ruled the country through sheer brutality, uh, rewarding uh, fellow uh, Sunnis uh, in particular, and uh, through sheer force, uh, use of torture, generating fear, uh, he managed to consolidate his power and hold on to his power for by Middle East, Middle East standards, uh, a relatively long time. Saddam Hussein's Ba'athas party was nothing like anything we'd seen in Iraq before. Can you take us through how Saddam's doctrines differed from other Middle Eastern governments like Riyadh or Tehran? The Ba'ath party is secular. Uh, its roots are, um, or its ideological roots, are based in uh, an Arab nationalism, Arab socialism, because it does not derive its authority from God, uh, but instead from these more universal principles. Uh, it certainly in the 1960s and, and thereafter was regarded as a fundamental threat uh, to the traditional monarchies, uh, especially those uh, located within the Gulf. Uh, Saddam Hussein, of course, then as a result, uh, promoted a, um, a form of government, an ideology that uh, countries in the region regarded as a, a threat to their, their leadership, a threat to their very being. Uh, ironically, though, they, they did bankroll Saddam Hussein in his fighting with Iran in the 1980s, uh, and that was basically because they considered the Shiite, the Shiite government of Iran, to be the bigger threat. Politics makes strange bedfellows, they say. Can you take us through that war, the Iran-Iraq war from 1980 to 1988? You know, what were they fighting for and why was the fighting so brutal compared to other conflicts during this period? Iran and Iraq uh, had a long simmering uh, border dispute, a uh, dispute over con control of the Shad al-Arab a waterway. Iran um, had, of course, um, oil fields that offered a, a potential uh, economic uh, windfall to the uh, uh, to the Iraq government. If you're Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein, uh, it seemed to be a reasonable thing to um, to send your forces uh, into uh, Iranian territory, uh, seize oil wells, and um, gain control of this. Um, important waterway. Uh, unfortunately for Iraq, the early victories were reversed. The momentum of the war shifted from Iraq uh, to Iran. And over the course of, of the war started in uh, 
September 1980 uh, does not end until 1988. Over the course of these many years, we see the conflict swinging back and forth. So Iraq's early offensive is reversed. Um, Iran uh, goes on the offensive, um, actually into uh, Iraqi territory, uh, fighting over control of Basra, uh, fighting in the north of the country. The Kurds join the fighting, uh, joining with uh, Iran, occasion in which um, Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons against his own people, uh, using them against the Kurds, uh, uh, killing about uh, 5,000 uh, Kurds. Uh, but the war itself took, the to took a toll in hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of, of deaths, uh, civilian as well as military. Uh, it eventually uh, took, uh, went into the, um, into the oil fields. Uh, Iraq was, tar uh, ta was uh, targeting uh, oil facilities, uh, targeting uh, cities. Uh, so there, there was, um, in general, uh, catastrophic uh, human as well as uh, economic damage. And it was only when Iraq re-seized the initiative and pushed the Iranians back that we had what could be understood as a hurting stalemate that motivated both parties uh, to some kind of uh, a settlement. So with the Iran-Iraq war coming to an end, Saddam had lost 500,000 soldiers, and at this time still had the support of Washington behind him. Still licking his wounds from that war, he decided to turn his attention southward to the oil-rich nation of Kuwait. And on the 2nd of August 1990, Iraqi forces pushed across the border into sovereign Kuwaiti territory. Can you take us through why Saddam would make this fairly bold move? The, shall we say, resolution of the Iran-Iraq war, Saddam Hussein turns his, his sights to the south, Kuwait, obviously a oil-rich country. Uh, bills had come due. Uh, Saddam Hussein owed the Persian Gulf monarchies of a lot of money. Saddam Hussein was of a conspiratorial mindset, and uh, he believed that the, the West was conspiring against him. From his standpoint, taking over Kuwait, uh, anoint, anointing it as Iraq's 19th province seemed to be the solution to its problems. His troops stormed into uh, Kuwait in August of 1990, and the United States successfully organized an international coalition with UN Security Council support that would successfully push his forces out of Kuwait. Uh, it was in some ways a delicate operation because it involved bringing Middle Eastern countries on board, uh, including uh, Syria, uh, including Egypt, and of course, including the Persian Gulf monarchies under this big uh, umbrella. Uh, it was delicate, of course, because the United States was also an ally of Israel and Iraq tried to leverage that Israel-U.S. relationship to advantage. People remember, of course, the Scud missile attacks, Iraq, Scud missile attacks on, on Israel. Iraq's effort to draw Israel into the fighting to divide the coalition, uh, but uh, Israel was convinced that its involvement would be counterproductive, and the United States managed then to, to keep Israel on the sidelines. The United States also decided that it would not pursue Saddam Hussein's forces back into Iraq. Uh, the recognition at the time was that that would also split the coalition, that once the operation became this uh, defense of international law, reversing this illegal seizure of territory and became regime change, that is, moving into Iraq to uh, replace the Saddam Hussein regime, international support would wither. But the Bush administration also believed that time was not on Saddam Hussein's side, that the defeat in Kuwait would be humiliating for him. The public, the Shiites in particular, would rise up 
overthrow his regime and the United States would accomplish a regime change without the, the blood on its, its hands and, and the international distress that U.S. involvement would have caused. U.S. President George Bush Sr. knew the likely outcome if U.S. troops were to push into Iraq and conquer it. But the only thing keeping everyone in place in Iraq was Saddam's iron fist. Removing Saddam would likely result in a huge, bloody power vacuum between the Kurds, the Shiites, the Sunnis, and the remaining Ba'athists. The realization here may have been obvious to President Bush Sr., but his son President Bush Jr. may not have had as much foresight as his father on this one. In 2003, under the guise of chemical weapons of mass destruction being manufactured in Iraq, a US-led coalition invaded Iraq. Can you take us through this invasion and what the outcome of it was? During the 1990s, of course, um, the Iraqi government played this cat and mouse game with international inspectors. Iraq was required to transparently disarm as a result uh, in to, to bring it into compliance with multiple uh, UN resolutions. Uh, Iraq would sometimes let in inspectors, sometimes let in inspectors after delays, sometimes deny Iraq, uh, excuse me, uh, international inspectors access to uh, Iraqi facilities. And in 1990, not, 1998, um, kicked out um, the uh, inspectors uh, entirely uh, so that um, the international community didn't really have the eyes and ears on the ground anymore to monitor uh, Saddam Hussein's um, activities. Uh, it turns out that very early on in the early 1990s, um, Saddam Hussein actually had rid the country of his chemical and biological weapon stocks. Why he played this game then is somewhat mysterious. Uh, lots of different theories uh, about that. Um, very, uh, there was a, a popular theory that he um, was trying to have his cake and eat it too. Uh, he wanted um, Iran to believe that he had, uh, that he, he still had these weapons of mass destruction, uh, perhaps the United States too, to some extent, uh, fearing that if they believed that he didn't have these weapons, uh, they might invade. So this was his, this was his um, ace in the hole for security purposes. Uh, but at the same time, Having those weapons around would have been a liability. There would have been evidence lying around that he, uh, in fact, still retained them. And the West would persist with their very punishing uh, economic sanctions. So his hope was that if he didn't provide them with evidence, that is, if um, they could not conclude conclusively uh, that he, he had this, these weapons, uh, he could, um, in fact, get uh, sanctions lifted. Whether or not he would eventually have restocked his um, arsenal with uh, biological and chemical weapons is an open question. Uh, even when the Iraq study group, uh, headed by a Charles Dulfer, uh, concluded in uh, 2004 that Iraq did not have weapons of mass destruction, they still concluded that he intended, when sanctions were lifted, uh, to uh, restart those, those programs. The justification for the invasion was the nuclear weapons they thought Iraq had, but the US never found any when they got there. And to be frank, even if they were there in the first place, while they were being talked about, Saddam could have quite easily shipped them out of the country fairly quickly. The fact they weren't there, though, do you think that's a failing of US intelligence or was the whole nuclear weapons thing just of a justification for a plan they already wanted to go ahead with? The belief that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction was widely shared in the U.S. Uh, intelligence committee. Uh, excuse me, in the U.S. intelligence community, Saddam Hussein's behavior was certainly certainly not innocent. It, it, it suggested at least that he had something to hide. After the fact, of course, we can come up with reasons why he behaved the way he did, but certainly when someone acts furtively, it suggests that they, they are hiding something. It would have taken, given this belief that in fact he had weapons, uh, had these weapons, it would have taken a lot of evidence 
uh, for uh, us, for people on the outside intelligence agencies to conclude that he, he didn't have uh, these weapons. Uh, Saddam Hussein, it appears, recognized that. And in fact, it seems that part of his thinking was that if you let these people in and they start asking questions and they start looking around, they're going to see things. They're going to discover things. There are documents. There are people who knew of these weapons. In fact, they did once exist. And once you start on that track, it's a, um, it's a downward slope. Um, his fear is you're never going to be able to provide uh, satisfying answers. But I will also say in, in that context that there have been a number of really important in-depth studies. Uh, the U.S. Senate um, uh, conducted one. Uh, I mentioned the, the, the Dulfer study. Uh, and these um, studies are treasure troves for people like me, academics, who are interested in the psychological and political and organizational roots of behavior in that they they just they show how in the case of psychology a belief can take shape and it basically is uh, it immunizes the the holders against evidence um, it was just way too easy to read all sorts of evidence that we now see in hindsight was basically exculpatory evidence that is evidence that um, showed in fact uh, or could have shown that Iraq was not uh, pursuing a weapons of, of mass destruction or did not possess weapons of mass destruction, but interpreting it instead to suggest that, in fact, uh, he did. So you can take even innocent uh, evidence and given the, give, given the right set of beliefs, uh, read it um, with the very opposite uh, conclusion. Um, I can give you um, uh, examples of that. Um, uh, trucks uh, that had been used in Iraq's biological weapons program are seen with uh, from uh, satellites um, uh, um, on the ground. So natural conclusion that these trucks are still involved in biological weapons programs innocent explanation for it. You have a truck. It's a perfectly good truck. You hold on to the truck, and put it to a new use. But again, from the outside, how would you know that for sure? And given all the other evidence and, and, and given the fact that, um, it, that inspectors are being deprived of access, it, it, it becomes a, a very big problem to, to prove otherwise. What intelligence analyst is going to put his or her career on the line to make a case based on this kind of um, flimsy evidence, especially when you have in the, the Bush administration this eagerness for finding um, evidence of Iraqi weapons to justify a war with Iraq? Well, if that's the case, what do you think was the U.S. reason for going into Iraq? What was the justification for this war? Well, that's the um, million-dollar question. Uh, I can't count the number of books and, and articles that have been written responding to that, that question, uh, all arriving at different conclusions. Of course, there are those who claim it was um, the oil companies or the Israel lobby, uh, so-called neoconservatives in the Bush White House who were pushing for democratization in the Middle East, um, hoping to uh, put a regime in power in Iraq that would fight terrorism, would align itself with the West, things that were imagined as, as byproducts of, of democratization. Uh, there are more personal personally oriented explanations. Um, Bush, that is, Bush Jr. Uh, trying to one up his father, settling the Iraq issue in a way that his, his father, George H.W. Bush, uh, could not um, after the uh, Desert Storm operation. 
the fact that um, you had a lot of carryovers from the uh, Bush senior administration to the George W. Bush administration also lent credence to this idea of unfinished business. Uh, Colin Powell, of course, had been chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the first Bush administration. He was Secretary of State in the George W. Bush administration. Uh, Dick Cheney had been Secretary of Defense to George Bush Sr. and was, of course, now Vice President and a close trusted advisor of George uh, W. Bush. So it seemed like these people were pushing to finish business, to right some, some wrongs. But the reality is, and this is an important point, that this was a decision unlike other major wartime war initiation decisions, that is, the decisions that were made by previous administrations, in the sense that it really was never a decision. It was basically a non-decision. There was never a time when the principal advisors, George Bush, sat around a big table in a room and talked about the pros and cons, as Obama did, for instance, in late 2009 with his nine sessions where he, um, for many hours, uh, brought together intelligence and military people, and they tried to understand the problem and arrive at an appropriate uh, decision before he sent 30,000 additional U.S. troops into uh, Afghanistan. Never a, a meeting like this. From literally the first weeks of the Bush administration, the planning started. The Pentagon was tasked with coming up with options. Rumsfeld was pushing the Pentagon to come up with options that fit his vision of war, given his belief in a revolution in warfare that gave the United States a significant advantage in taking on adversaries abroad. The United States, given its technological advantages, could go into a country quickly, bring down its, its government, produce uh, regime change, and then move on to, to new conquests uh, in other uh, countries. So there's this really strong belief uh, in uh, defense circles uh, within the, the Bush White House that a war with Iraq was doable. It could be one on the cheap. It wouldn't be another desert storm operation that took six months to get U.S. forces into positions in the region, half a million troops. The United States could basically bring down the Hussein regime on the fly, on uh, quickly and relatively painlessly at low cost. So what I'm saying is that people, uh, Bush um, advisors, Bush himself, all came into this with perhaps different motivations. It, it's, um, it's impossible to come up with any one goal or any even small set of goals that the, uh, that the, the principles here uh, sought to accomplish through, through an invasion. The important thing is they generally adhered to this belief that a war could be won quickly and given the absence of any kind of formal meeting where they could resolve their differences and, and figure out an appropriate strategy and tactics, given their goals, they could, they could rest in the, shall we say, illusion that the Iraqi, an Iraqi war would offer only good things that it could accomplish what they want, perhaps it could accomplish what others want, but there was no effort to resolve the tensions in, in their views, resolve or address the, the possibility that if, for instance, they went in to deal with weapons of mass destruction and engaged in an operation that was optimized for that purpose, maybe it wouldn't accomplish the democracy goal. Or maybe the democracy goal would be 
really painstaking, involve a long operation in a way that just going in with weapons for weapons of mass destruction would not. It was, let's go into the country. No real discussion about what the operation would entail, how long U.S. troops would stay. Um, and as a result, there was a huge, important about face once U.S. troops got into the country. Once the United States was there, basically the any rules that had been established for operation were changed. When Paul Bremer, the Coalition Provisional Authority, were put in charge of Iraq with seemingly a mandate to dramatically change the political landscape in the country. And that uh, proves to be the, the basis of a growing uh, insurgency and rebellion against U.S. presence. If we go back to just before the invasion, as the airstrikes began over Baghdad, Donald Rumsfeld, then Secretary of Defense, gave a number of amazing press conferences, claiming that the Iraqis would lay down their arms as the Americans came in, and that they would be welcomed as liberators into a new democracy. We all know that's not what happened. And when the Americans did come in, instead of welcome parades, Iraqis put up stubborn resistance in certain areas, with lootings and sabotage and the insurgency against the US beginning on practically day one of the invasion. What made the US think that Iraqi civilians would welcome US forces into their territory? Initially, uh, Rumsfeld, uh, Paul Wolfowitz, in his testimony before Congress, uh, stated their sincere belief that American troops would be greeted as liberators, not as occupiers. The reasoning was that, and, and Wolfowitz, Wolfowitz stated this uh, in his testimony before Congress, that there, were, there really was no history of severe Sunni Shiite uh, violence. Uh, and to some extent, that was true. I mean, Saddam Hussein basically had kept the overt tensions down through his oppressive practices. But of course, there was no accounting for what would happen in the vacuum once you've removed Saddam Hussein from the picture. And Iraq lacks governments. And Iraq lacks police forces. The military of Iraq has been disbanded per the dictates of the coalition provisional authority. And everything changes. And of course, as U.S. troops become basic targets for the resistance, U.S. troops supporting a new primarily Shiite-led uh, uh, government, uh, it um, gave grounds to the um, Sunnis to express their, shall we say, express their grievances. The Coalition Provisional Authority, or the CPA, did two things that proved highly detrimental to, uh, to stability uh, in the country. First thing they did was issue coalition provisional authority rule number one, which was debothification, removing the Baath from power. This was not something that um, hadn't been anticipated. Uh, there was some discussion in the US government about removing the vestiges of Saddam Hussein from Iraqi governance. Uh, Denazification of Germany was addressed as the uh, potential model here. It was generally assumed that the United States would not uh, go down too deep in the leadership uh, triangle. That is that it would decapitate the regime, take off the, the top leadership, but being a member of the Ba'ath Party was was not in itself um, compromising. You have to recognize that being part of the Ba'ath Party in Iraq was basically a professional ticket, much like being a member of the Communist Party was in the old Soviet Union. So it's not just the true believers who join, it's the teachers and the engineers and, and people who want to get someplace in government, the government managers. And unfortunately, the United States turned debothification over to a person named Ahmed Shalabi, 
and uh, a, a Shiite, and he, um, he he went after the Ba'athification with uh, enthusiasm, uh, so much so that the Sunnis who had lost privilege in the country regarded it as the Sunnification of the country. And a horrible byproduct of that was that Iraq lost its government managers, the people who knew how to run government ministries, which I shall say were also um, physically uh, shells of, literally shells of their former self. Uh, as a result of the looting, uh, the buildings were looted down to the copper pipes. The second, uh, it, but also uh, teachers, um, engineers, have lost their, their jobs. And of course, this creates huge resentment. Uh, but of course, it, it also results in a decapitation of, of the, the knowledgeable elite, elite uh, within the country. They have increased social tensions. But at the same time, you also have a um, dismissing of, of people who know how to do things, run things, teach things, and so forth. The second coalition, Order Number 2, disbanded the military. And this came entirely out of the blue. The, um, uh, it was not discussed uh, before the um, occupation. In fact, um, Bush administration officials, including Condoleezza Rice as Secretary of, uh, uh, as um, National Security Advisor uh, at the time, were totally taken by surprise uh, that this occurred. An army of 400,000 was disbanded. And of course, the, the army itself is led uh, principally by Sunnis. Again, you have a problem of a uh, loss in, in privilege. Hundreds of thousands of people now out of work. Out of losing, having lost their status, um, and they're relieved of their positions with their guns in hand, and they know where the weapons arsenals are. And the United States ends up, as a consequence of this order, not only fueling unrest because of the unemployment and status loss uh, involved, uh, but also essentially arming uh, the uh, insurgents uh, who would pick up arms against U.S. forces and the Shiite-led Shiite government of Iraq. These resentful people who now have no job, no career prospects, but are well-trained and now are armed with U.S. weapons, are these the same people who will go on later to fight against the U.S. government and the Baghdad government in Al-Qaeda and later ISIS? Yes, Absolutely. And of course, you had militia on the Shiite side. And so the picture is a lot more complicated than that. You had Shiite militia uh, conflicting with other Shiite militia. Um, uh, although many of these uh, militia, the Shiite, operated under the cover of the government through the, through the interior ministry. They wore police uniforms. Uh, so they were carrying out their, their campaigns through... Um, in, in the uniform of government, um, um, Al Sadr, uh, who I mentioned uh, earlier, controlled the health ministry, and he's using ambulances to transport uh, his materials. Uh, and the the Sunnis are on the outside; you know, they're not using the the government uh, for their sectarian purposes. They're at war uh, with this uh, government. But um, absolutely, uh, it is the the rank and file who formed the, the troops of the, um, of the Sunni insurgency, and it is the officers uh, who end up um, in uh, leadership positions uh, within this uh, insurgency. Because many of these guys who are working as government employees can no longer get a job due to debathification, they need to turn to one of these extremist groups to get employment, because obviously they still need to put food on the table. But where does the money for these extremist groups come from? Uh, these groups are entrepreneurial. Uh, certainly the um, Al-Qaeda-led uh, groups, um, and Al-Qaeda um, ends up in a, with a predominant uh, uh, position within this uh, insurgency uh, by involving itself in everything from uh, extortion, um, collecting um, tariffs, uh, and um, um, 
seizing property. Um, this was certainly true of the uh, Shiite militia um, operating in, in Baghdad, uh, taking over homes, um, gas stations, um, charging exorbitant um, rents, um, monopoly prices for things like fuel. Uh, so you're, you're talking about an insurgency that um, is in, in some ways um, also a, a criminal element within the country. Uh, doing what it needs to do in order to to raise cash, seize resources, and of course you also have uh, foreign fighters and um, uh, foreign uh, benefactors uh, from abroad uh, who are uh, helping uh, to, um, uh, to to fund all of this. But you know, in the end, um, how much cash is is required uh, to if you if you have the the weaponry uh, to um, to, to shoot at um, troops, to, um, to, to build, uh, in the beginning, relatively primitive, but increasingly more sophisticated um, IEDs to, to take out troops. I mean, with an insurgency, you're, you're not talking about a raising an army in, in traditional terms, where it is uh, capital intensive, uh, requiring uh, aircraft and, and, and tanks, um, you're talking about insurgents who um, are in some ways part-time workers. I mean, they can hold jobs, but um, uh, engage in these other activities on the side. Uh, and it also, of course, makes them more difficult targets because they blend in so easily with the, uh, the regular population. When these groups like ISIS really began to pick up steam and start conquering cities in the northwest of Iraq near the Syrian border, Baghdad called out to the U.S. for help. President Obama at the time had only just pulled the last U.S. troops out of Iraq and was incredibly hesitant to get reinvolved in the country, as it had been nothing but a debacle for almost a decade now. Seeing the U.S. show hesitancy, Baghdad put a call into support into Tehran, who began airstrikes and troop supports for the Shiite government in Baghdad that very day. Why would Tehran be so keen to jump in against groups like ISIS? Well, Iran had links to the, um, the, many of the militia groups that operated in Iraq. They were a key source of, of leverage for the Iran regime. Uh, Iran, of course, had ties to some political parties as well as it, uh, in Iraq. Uh, the, the Sunnis themselves tended to, to look at the Shiite as Persians, uh, in, in that sense, um, even extensions of the uh, Iranian uh, regime. Uh, but there was, in fact, courtesy of being in the same neighborhood and, uh, and of course, sharing this um, broader religious affiliation, a, 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 a kinship uh, between Iran and, and Iraq at some basic level uh, that, of course, the United States as a distant ally um, could not uh, establish. But certainly, once U.S. troops were gone, no one was anxious to go back in. And I include the U.S. military, the Pentagon. They were uh, never uh, enthusiastic about sending additional U.S. forces back into Iraq um, until, of course, ISIS moves into the um, northern part of the country, uh, takes uh, literally a third of, of the country, um, occupying um, uh, major facilities, seizing banks. You um, asked previously about how these these groups fund themselves, um, seizing banks, taking uh, money, cash, gold, um, and leading to the very quick evisceration of Iraqi security forces. Hundreds of thousands of uh, of troops basically disappeared. The Iraqi military that the United States had spent so much time and so much money uh, trying to to build to to um, take care of itself to provide for a national security within and without uh, was obviously not up to the task um, and um, from the u.s standpoint and from obama's standpoint there was really no alternative uh, except to to re-intervene and what's interesting at that point is that uh, Obama's initial concern about 
getting Iraq's parliament to approve the deal was was no longer an issue. So it says something about this um, overwhelming feeling of a security threat um, making the difference. Uh, something that wasn't present in 2011, uh, that uh, was present in 2014. And of course, by 2014, we had a government that wanted uh, U.S. help. Um, it was a matter of, of survival, saving the country from ISIS. The Saddam regime had been overthrown, the cork removed from the bottle, and now, like we've seen so often around the world, a power vacuum opens up. It was thought by the US that the pro-Baghdan forces they'd been training up over the last decade would be able to be strong enough to quash any rebellion, but when that time came, they quickly dissolved into the wind, and swathes of Iraq quickly fell to ISIS. To the people living in the ISIS territories, the new overlords were brutal, bringing back archaic religious laws. But at least they were Sunni. And even then, since the Shiite government had come to power in Baghdad, many of these areas had been badly neglected for infrastructure repairs. Power stations damaged by the initial US invasion were still left disrepaired. And that was almost a decade ago. When ISIS came in and took over a few of these towns, they brought with them stable electricity, something they'd been without for years. For some people, it actually seemed like it might be a better way forward. Like it might be something worth fighting for. But their brutal style of ruling was not for everyone, and resistance came in many forms. It cannot be understated how devastating ISIS was to people living in these cities. During this next stage of the war, Iraq really broke up into about three factions. The first one being ISIS, who at this point of the story controls huge parts of Syria and about a third of Iraq. They control most of the oil fields and the Sunni areas in Iraq, right to the west. The second faction is the internationally recognized government in Baghdad, who normally everyone would jump behind, but they do come with a lot of baggage. The government in Baghdad is majorly corrupt. They regularly punish Sunnis, and from a US perspective, they are far too closely tied with the government in Iran, who are, after all, a primary enemy of the US. To throw too much weight behind Baghdad may just make Iran stronger when this whole thing is over, so the US become hesitant. The third faction here are the Kurds, the largest people group in the world without a nation state. The Kurdish people live in an area that stretches over parts of Iran, Armenia, Turkey, Syria, and about a third of Iraq. And in comparison to the rest of Iraq, they have a far more democratic form of government. For all intents and purposes, it really does feel like a separate country to the rest of Iraq, and this is even before the fighting. The Kurds have been fighting for autonomy for years now, but the Kurds gaining a state would mean that five other countries lose big chunks of their land, something the governments in those countries would very much not like to do. The Kurds have proven themselves great fighters over the years, having fought almost every single one of these countries. And ideologically, were probably the closest to Western ideals you could find in the region. So the decision was made to give them buckets of US weapons and lots of money and tell them to go fight ISIS on behalf of Washington. But let's take a step back. Let's find out who are the Kurds and why they would volunteer to go do the hard fighting in Iraq on behalf of the US. And to talk more about that, we turn to our second guest. Part 2 the oasis. The the big difference that the the, the Kurdistan uh, with with Iraq with the rest of Iraq is the security, and of course also the govern the the govern the, the government that the government the the, the the country. So, in terms of democracy, respecting the rule of law, uh, women's rights, human rights, freedom of speech. Uh, Kurdistan is a very successful story in Iraq, and also not only in Iraq, actually, in Middle East as well. Dia Amin is a scholar and diplomat for the Kurdistan mission to the EU, as well as a former advisor to the KPD vice president. Dia has written many papers on the situation in Kurdistan, and there is very little people out there who understand it better than him. He joins us today. Kurdistan uh, region of Iraq is, uh, is an autonomous region in northern Iraq. Kurdistan is a uh, parliamentary democracy with the regional assembly of 111 seats. 
and the current president of Kurdistan region of Iraq is Nechirvan Barzani and the current prime minister is Masrur Barzani. I mean, in terms of religion, the Kurds are, 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 the majority of the Kurds are Sunni Muslims, but there is also a small fractions of Shi'i Muslims within the Kurds, as well as we have other minorities like Yazidis uh, uh, and Kakis as well. They are non-Muslim religions. So uh, they, they, in terms of similarity, religion-wise, I would say there are similarity, but culture-wise, uh, there is, of course, differences in terms of language, uh, the Kurds are, in the Kurdistan region, we celebrate uh, our uh, language, uh, we, we have a different language, uh, we speak different language, uh, majority of uh, education is, is in English, uh, I'm sorry, in, in Kurdish, uh, as well as English as well, and uh, some of it in Arabic. So obviously the governing style between Erbil, which is the capital of Kurdistan, and Baghdad, which is the capital of all of Iraq, you know, are very, very different. Uh, can you take us through how these differ from each other? The Kurdistan leadership, they have a completely different style of, of leading the, the, the country and, and the, the region. Even though like both region economically are based on oil, oil revenue, but KRG spends oil revenue to develop the region and public service and the road are highly developed in Kurdistan in comparing with the rest of Iraq. And due to its stability, the Kurdistan region has also seen more foreign investment companies that they want to invest in Kurdistan, but not in Iraq. Also, one of the, 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 the issues are they, not, they don't feel safe to invest in Iraq, but they feel very safe to invest in Kurdistan region. There are very big name oil companies that are operating in Kurdistan, like Oxenmobil, Chevron, General Energy of Turkey and Taka from UAE. And there's a lot of other oil companies from uh, Canada, also a Russian oil company as well, Gazprom as well as operating in the region. And another thing is that make Kurdistan region stands out really uh, in comparison with the rest of Iraq is that the Kurds preserve and the, the rich culture of, of peaceful coexistence and mutual recon uh, recognition. Also the tolerance among all the community and faiths and ethnic groups in Kurdistan region. So therefore, the Kurdistan region will continue and will remain a peaceful and harmony and stability for all other minorities that they live in in Kurdistan, which is they have been living together in the past centuries. That is include the Turkmen's, Christians, Yazidis, Kharkis, Armenians, as well as the Arabs that they're coming from other parts of Iraq living in Kurdistan. Over the last few decades, the Kurds have fought with the Iraqi government, the Iranian government, especially the Turkish government, and even the Syrian government. In a region where these governments can hardly agree on anything, why do they all choose to fight the Kurds? You know, I'm sure you viewer, as, as you mentioned at the beginning, they might know something about Kurdistan. Kurdistan uh, divided to, to four parts back in after the Second World War. So therefore, there are in every in all these four countries, like in Syria, Turkey, Iran and Iraq, there are minority Kurds living there. But the Kurdistan region of Iraq, with the help of the coalition forces back in 1991, after the Gulf War, uh, in particular the United States uh, with France and the United Kingdom, they created a no-fly zone for the Kurds in Kurdistan region. So therefore, they were able to, to be able, uh, they were able to govern themselves and established a government, and uh, they also. Uh, th therefore, the, the, this, the, the dreams of the Kurds to, to be independent is still alive amongst those Kurds and living in other part of uh, other part of I mean, living part of other countries like Turkey, Iran, and and Syria. So that dream is still there, and of course, for the Kurds in in, in Kurdistan region of Iraq as well. That's why in two thousand and in twenty. 5th of September 2017, the Kurds in Kurdistan region of Iraq, they hold a referendum. And the referendum was was something the people wanted it, really. It was, it was not something that the politician pushed for it. It was the, the desire and the dream of the people. The, and therefore, 93% 93, 93 of the population voted for yes to be independent from Iraq. So that is the reason that uh, the, the dream of uh, being independent and break up from those countries is still alive and that's why it's uh, sometimes most of the time it's threatened those countries it threats them that uh, you know 
it threat them with the, with this the dream that the people they have there. Arguably the biggest supporter of the Kurds over the years has been the Americans. Putting up a no-fly zone to stop Turkey using Kurdish villages as bombing practice, and building lots of infrastructure in Kurdistan. The Kurdish economy relies quite heavily on US investment. So why would the Americans be supportive of the Kurds? What are they hoping to gain from this relationship? As I mentioned, the Americans helped the Kurds to, to create no-fly zone in 1991. So they protected the Kurds and the Kurds have since then become uh, a very close allies to the Americans. Also in 2003, the Kurds, they helped the Americans in liberating Iraq. Uh, again, uh, also in the war against uh, ISIS, against terrorists, the, the, the Kurds, they played a very important role. More than uh, when the ISIS attacked Mosul and they attacked in Kurdistan in 2014, the Peshmerga forces were the only forces on the ground uh, protecting the region and the country and protecting the world, uh, to be honest with you. They were fighting on behalf of the world and they've lost 1,200 1, Peshmerga forces and uh, also around 7,000 to 8,000 Peshmergas were wounded. So, and the relations, as I said, it began, uh, it become more alive in the 90s and also in October 2005, President Mesut Barzani, uh, the former president of Kurdistan, who is the current uh, president of the Kurdistan Democrat Party, one of the major political parties in Kurdistan, he visited the uh, United States and he was welcomed by the, the, the uh, President uh, George Bush. There is a lot in terms of like political, uh, a very strong political relationship with the, between the KRG and the, and the US. Also, there is a uh, good economic tra relations between those countries as well. As I mentioned earlier, there are big names companies uh, that they work in, they operate in Kurdistan, especially in oil, that they are Americans. For example, as I talk like Chevron, Hess and uh, Aspect Energy, they all are the big names companies that they operate in Kurdistan. Whilst Iraqi Kurdistan is practical autonomy in Iraq, the Kurdish areas of southeastern Turkey have far less autonomy, and they've always had a fairly frosty relationship with Turkey's government Ankara. Why is the relationship between Erbil and Ankara so frayed, and why have they been fighting each other for so long? Okay, there have been ups and downs in the relations, but the Kurdistan region had its best relations with Turkey back in 2009 till 2013 or 14, I would say. Those years were very golden years for both sides. Also, one of the major issues has been the uh, PKK, the, the Kurdish political parties that they fighting for independent Kurdistan and Turkey, that they, uh, most of the time, that the Turkey, they carrying out a uh, military operation inside the Kurdistan region's Iraq to, be, to fight those, uh, the, the, this party, the PKK. And why are the PKK labeled as terrorists? You know, what do they do to get themselves on that list? Uh, to be honest with you, I have, I have, uh, I don't have a, a quite good knowledge why did the US did that, but it is it because they want to maintain a good relationship with Turkey because of that. But uh, the, this organization, this uh, political organization, is also labeled terrorist uh, in the European Union as well. So it's not only America. So they uh, they label them as a terrorist, not as again. But uh, I have. Uh, I don't really have a, as this is not my main focus because they are part of the Kurdistan region, uh, the Kurdistan in, in Turkey. So I don't, I don't really know why I have been, but again, uh, I doubt it is because to, it is because to have a, a good relationship with Turkey or to maintain a good relationship with Turkey. So because again, it's not the American only that they put them on the terrorist list, but the European Union as well. The Kurds that took on the majority of the fighting during the war with ISIS recaptured many of the major cities in Iraq and Syria. The area they now control and administer is much larger than the area they started with before the fighting with ISIS. Do you think their hope in getting into this war was that the international community would further recognize their legitimacy over some of these areas in northern Syria, northern Iraq, and eventually bits of eastern Turkey? No, abs absolutely not. I mean, the, the Kurds, they were protecting... Uh, the people, their citizens, uh, they were protecting the, the nation, and they were also actually protecting Iraq. So it, it wouldn't uh, collapse and they become uh, completely in the hand of ISIS. It
so they, they fought hard as well and they they stood there they they were not the one to to leave the the war just like other Iraqi forces that they did they were there it wasn't about to gain any international attention it was about to protect the humanity against the most brutal terrorist organizations in the world so that was the whole uh, the whole aim of fighting the ISIS and the majority of this fighting was done by the Peshmerga uh, can you take us through the, who the Peshmerga are and what they're responsible for in this war Peshmerga forces are the one that they fought uh, fought Iraqi regimes in the past Peshmerga forces are the one that they uh, liberated Kurdistan region, they protected Kurdistan region. Um, they fought and they have been, uh, there is, they have given so many martyrs for, for the sake of protecting Kurdistan. And Peshmerga forces are an official uh, army of Kurdistan and they are officially recognized in, within the framework of Kurdistan regional government. They are also officially recognized in Iraq as well. Where the Peshmerga really made a big name for themselves was in Rojava. Uh, can you take us through the events that happened there? Rojava, there are Kurds living in Syria, and they were denied by the by the Syrian government in the past. The Kurds, they don't even have the, the passport or the citizenship that they live in Syria because they were always considered as a sit, sit, second citizens that they were living in Syria. So after the ice attack... Again, the Kurds were in, 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 in Syria, they were the only forces that they, uh, they fight ISIS. And they did a really good job. And we, we all heard of the, uh, the liberation of Kobani. Kobani was the city where most affected. But uh, of course, uh, the Kurds, uh, they liberated and they, they win the battle against ISIS. Of course, with the help of the, the US uh, air forces as well as the Peshmerga forces that they... Uh, in the order of the uh, former president uh, Masoud Barzani, they, they went there. So they are there. Now they have uh, created a semi uh, kind of a uh, autonomous region uh, for themselves in that region. And uh, they have some sort of uh, government in place. Uh, they have. Uh, so, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> the Americans are co cooperating with them. After all this fighting, the Kurds liberated many cities all across the region, extending Kurdistan's reach far beyond its original borders, much to the dismay of countries like Turkey and the Iraqi government in Baghdad. The Turkish demanded Kurds leave certain cities, but the Americans stood between them and the Kurds. That was until President Trump gave a surprise order to American forces after a private phone call with President Erdogan of Turkey. Without any warning, the American troops picked up and left and abandoned their position, their Kurdish allies now thrown to the wolves. Within hours, Russian soldiers working on behalf of the Syrian government, Iraqi soldiers and Turkish soldiers moved into the positions vacated by the US and forced the Kurds out of many of the forward areas they'd worked so hard to liberate. What was the Kurdish reaction to being left in the lurch by the Americans on this one? Kirkuk has always been the heart of Kurdistan. It is its identity is the is, it belongs to Kurdistan. The history says that we don't just say it that the Kirkuk is belong to Kurdistan, but the history it says that the Kirkuk was part of Kurdistan. So the Kurds always considers as Kirkuk as their hearts. So what happened was uh, the Kirkuk wasn't uh, uh, after the. When the ISIS attacked the Kurds again, there they were the one that they protected the city and protected the citizens living there. And uh, when the ISIS were defeated, the Iraqi army then they want to get back the Kirkuk. And of course, with the help of a um, uh, some people within one political party, uh, they regain. And uh, Americans, I assume, they didn't want to be part of the that issue that will exist between the federal government of Iraq and the Kurdistan region. So they didn't really play an important role. But again, uh, the Iraqis, they attack Kirkuk with the help of a small few people within one political parties that they were majority in the city. 
And why do you think the Americans left the city of Kirkuk? You know, what were they hoping to gain from that? And again, uh, as I said, um, it was uh, some sort of deal that were uh, done by the former Iraqi Prime Minister Abadi with some people that they're working with one Kurdish political parties. And so, but the Americans were not, they did not have a base in Kirkuk, they had a base outside Kirkuk. And the, uh, to answer your questions, uh, part of your questions, the Kirkuk is important for the Kurds, not only because of the oil, but because of its identity, because the Kurd and they, uh, the majority of the people that live, they live in Kirkuk, they are Kurds and the minorities are Turkmens and the Arabs that they live in there, they were, the one that they were brought by the Saddams in the past, in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Uh, he brought them from other parts of Iraq to, he relocated them to Kirkuk. So he would wanted to change the demographic of the, of the population in Kirkuk. So they will have a kind of a less Kurds or kind of have an equal Kurds with Arabs and Turkmen's. It's a very tough question to answer, but without full US support, and the relationship between Erbil and Washington now in kind of a weird place. Can you see a path forward to an independent Kurdish state? I mean, during the referendum, both Turkey and Iran, they said uh, an independent Kurdistan will will bring a uh, unstable instability to the region. So that was the thing is, and this is uh, also uh, the fear of the uh, Kurdish nationalists in Turkey and Iran has always scare them away. Yes, they scare them about having any sort of a form of independent Kurdish states in the region because they probably might think also if the Kurds in, in, in Iraq will become independent, the Kurds in Turkey will ask the same thing and the Kurds in Iran will ask the same thing as well. Uh, so the, the, as I said, the KRG or the Kurdistan regional government of Iraq or the Kurdish officials, they want to have a, a excellent relationship with the neighbors and they try their best and they have they have been successfully actually, they managed to, to have a, a steady kind of a good relationship. Again, there has been ups and down in the relationship, which is normal. It happens between other, between other states as well. So, but uh, the relationship is that they, they have a good trade relationship. They have a political relationship. There have been exchange of delegations from both countries. There is, have been a lot of uh, tourist visitors as well from, from Turkey to Kurdistan, from Iran to Kurdistan and vice versa. So, the relationship for current time, as of like what Kurdistan region is stand as a region in an, within the federal Iraq, everything is fine. But you never know in the future. In my uh, different government, they might have a different view. But the current government, again, they opposed to such an idea. Again, that was uh, uh, it happened in two thousand seventeen when we carried out the referendum. They both countries they were opposed. Iran closed its border for 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 a while, but Turkey did not. They continue the trade with Kurdistan even during that time. So, uh, as I said in the future, you never know. Maybe the next government or the uh, they will be think uh, differently than the current government. It seemed like the Kurds would always be the American hammer in the Middle East, the pointy end of the spear. And in return, the Americans would defend the Kurds. Now, though, the relationship with the Kurds is a bit rocky. The Nurbil may not be as keen to get involved in the US objectives as they were before. But ISIS is defeated. Iraq is liberated. Well, no. ISIS is still holding onto small amounts of territory in the West. And many of the ISIS fighters are now angry and scattered throughout the Middle East, rather than being concentrated in one area. The Russians are happy with there being chaos as long as Damascus holds up. The Turks aren't looking to launch any big offensive, and being tied up in Azerbaijan, Somalia, Cyprus, and Libya, to name a few, will probably keep them busy for a while. Even Erbil is looking to just consolidate what they have, rather than going on big offensives like they used to before. And ISIS is regaining strength rather than losing it. The wild card here, though, is Iran, whose influence is growing rapidly. When the US pivoted towards Erbil as their primary ally, the Baghdad government took more and more influence, support, and money from Tehran. And now Tehran has much more influence in Iraq than they have in any time in the last few centuries. But what will this mean for the balance of power in the region? Well, to talk more about that, we turn to our third guest. Part 3. The March to the Mediterranean. You know, just from my perspective, you know, I have 
I have, as a former commander of U.S. Central Command, I've, I, I've always considered Iraq to be kind of a linchpin of the region. So, and, and said a different way, a really important country for us to have a good relationship with. That said, it is, it's, uh, Iraq remains at a very, very difficult place. Uh, you know, over the last uh, year uh, or two, the escalation of regional conflict and, you know, global competition, you know, has continued to create some uh, social and political impacts on the country that, uh, that they're having to deal with. Uh, COVID-19 is having an impact on them like it is everybody else and in terms of adding to health and economic woes. Um, and, and those two things are really exacerbating many of the longstanding tensions that uh, that are already present in uh, in 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 Iraq. Uh, they have, still have a relatively new government who is still dealing with things like political deadlock and fiscal pressures and political rivalry rivalries and and limited institutional capacity. Um, so you know it's not in a great place institutions wise, uh, and it's still you know, deals with uh, poor governance and, 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 you know, an epidemic of corruption that remains a, you know, remains a problem in, in, in their, in their culture. Um, and of course, uh, over the last year or so, it's bore, uh, it's bore the brunt of the U.S.-Iran uh, tensions, uh, obviously coming to a head with the operation uh, that uh, the United States conducted uh, to kill Qasem Soleimani. Uh, that really, I think, brought, uh, brought the pressure, a heavy amount of pressure onto, onto Iraq, which they've managed to work through, but yet continues to persist in the area. And of course, all of that at the same time Time, they're dealing with the remnants of ISIS, uh, which you know have, have physically been defeated, but of course remain uh, prominent uh, in remnants around the country, and for which the Iraqi forces and coalition continue to keep pressure on. General Joseph Vodal is a recently retired four-star U.S. general who served as the United States Special Operation Commander and was also commander of the U.S. Central Command. General Voto was one of the highest ranking members of the US Armed Forces and was in overall command of many of the theaters we have been talking about in this episode. We are very pleased to have him join us today. Well, what what happened, you know, ISIS when when they uh, you know, began their campaign a number of years ago, 2014, 2013, 2014, was really focused on creating this physical caliphate. Uh, this was one of the big differences between ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda envisions a, a caliphate, but they have a much longer vision to get to it. Uh, ISIS was not going to take that long-term view, and were very, very keen on establishing a physical caliphate, and they did for the most part. Um, and so a major aim of the coalition uh, campaign plan was to actually to, to, was to take that take that terrain, that physical caliphate away from ISIS, uh, and we did. Uh, we were successful in doing that. And of course, destroyed a lot of ISIS in that. Uh, but ISIS, like as a, as most terror organizations uh, are, you know, went to ground. They dispersed. Uh, they melded back into you know back into society both in Iraq and Syria. And so uh, the, the remnants of it are still there and they still uh, have have the ability to, to conduct low level operations and to cause um, instability in, in areas. And so what you see is a, is a, a much, a much lower grade uh, uh, campaign by ISIS that looks like insert, looks more like insurgency than it looks like ISIS at their peak of, of several years ago. But they're still very, very present on this. And of course, uh, there are detention areas in in uh, in Iraq or in Syria, you know, for for foreign fighters that have yet to be repatriated to include a number that need to kind of come back to Iraq. And then there's, you know, the family members that are in uh, that are in displacement camps uh, uh, around the area there. So there there that. That is still very the movement. ISIS is still very, very present, even if the physical caliphate that was ISIS is no longer in existence. These so-called cleanup operations to eliminate some of these small pockets of ISIS fighters. Who is doing the majority of the fighting here? 
most of it these days uh, in, in Iraq is the Iraqi army. And the Iraqi army does that with the assistance of the coalition. Uh, the, you know, the remaining coalition forces on the ground uh, really remain there for that specific person purpose to make sure that uh, that the uh, that the Iraqis have the support and uh, that they need to to keep this under under pressure. And again, as they become more proficient at this, this provides opportunities for the coalition to readdress their their force presence on the ground. But for the most part, that's being done by the Iraqis. If you were to watch Iranian television at the moment, you would assume the PMF is doing the majority of the fighting. Uh, can you take us through who the PMF are and why they're very important to understanding this story? So this is, uh, I'm, I'm glad you're asking this question because I think this is something that people don't understand quite well. The PMF uh, is both an umbrella term, uh, the popular mobilization forces, is both an umbrella term and an umbrella organization. And it's an it's umbrella organization for a variety of militias that came together in the, you know, the 2014 time frame uh, when, uh, when the country of Iraq was, was really reeling from uh, the effects of, uh, of this onslaught by ISIS. As, as, as many of your listeners will recall, um, you know, portions of the Iraqi army literally vaporized in, uh, in, uh, in Mosul, in, in, uh, in the onslaught uh, that that ICE has presented to them, and that was a variety of reasons for that. Most of it is bad leadership and in corruption in the ranks, and certainly in the leadership of the of the military uh, with that. But it went away, and the country was in a very dire straits. Uh, and as as the coalition formed and began to undertake the effort of rebuilding the Iraqi army and getting them back to where they needed to be to address this threat, uh, they still had to deal with uh, with ISIS uh, and. And so uh, the idea was to bring together these militia groups um, under the guise of, of popular mobilization forces and use them to uh, to fight ISIS. And they came from all different tribes and, and sects. So there were Shia, there were Sunni, there were Christian, there were Yazidis that, uh, you know, that all groups that all kind of formed this broad popular mobilization force. The majority of those were Shia. And in fact, uh, the Grand Ayatollah Sistani put out a call to uh, the groups to come to the aid of, of Iraq and, 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 and help them. And so this is kind of how the PMF uh, came along. So it was in a crisis and the Iraqis needed them. And, and for the most part, these groups, all of them, uh, you know, served the nation of Iraq uh, well, in terms of, of fighting uh, fighting ISIS, uh, the challenge, of course, is that uh, uh, as as the ISIS threat dissipated, as the campaign plan worked, uh, you know, with with the activities they did, but more importantly, with the activities that the Iraqi army and the coalition did to address the ISIS caliphate, uh, these groups these groups remained, especially the Shia portion of them, and all of them are not necessarily beholden to the government of Iraq, a number of them are more beholden to the government of Iran. And of course, this is where the problem comes in with the, uh, with the, uh, with the popular mobilization forces. The prime minister, prime minister Abadi at the time, uh, asked for the demobilization of them. His uh, successor did as well. And a number of them did demobilize. These were largely uh, the, the non-Shia groups that, that you know, came to the aid. And then when the crisis crisis had passed, went back to their communities. That, that was not uniformly the case with the, pop, with the Shia uh, uh, militia groups that were part of the PMF. And what makes these guys different to, let's say, Hezbollah? Why not just make this another offshoot of Hezbollah rather than a whole different thing? Well, uh, Hezbollah is, is an out-and-out, uh, you know, terrorist <clears throat> organization. Some of the militias that are that are included in into the popular mobilization forces are, in fact, designated terrorist organizations. So, if you look at an organization like uh, Kitab Hezbollah, that's that's an organization. You know, my country, the United States, has designated as a terrorist group. But there are other Shia militia groups in there that. Uh, you know, have varying allegiance to the, you know, both the Iraqis and or the I Iranians that haven't necessarily been 
uh, been uh, been characterized as terrorist organizations. Um, so uh, the makeup of the PMF is fundamentally different than uh, than Hezbollah is, uh, and uh, Hezbollah is as you, as we see now actually has a very uh, well formed political element to it that is now a you know kind of a fact of nature uh, in uh, in the political landscape of of Lebanon. So while there are some similarities between the organizations, there are also some dissimilarities between the organizations. So you, they're not it's not a one size fits all here with them. Tehran has often talked about the concept of a sheer controlled corridor all the way to the sea, stretching from Iran through the north of Iraq, through the north of Syria, into Lebanon, connecting Iran with the Mediterranean Sea. How likely do you think it was that this corridor could ever come to fruition? Well, I think to some extent they've had a working corridor for a, for a, uh, a period of time, um, and in, in 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 some instances it's <clears throat> it's a contested working corridor. I mean, there's 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 been uh, very clear evidence that they have moved materials through uh, Iraq and then taken them through uh, through uh, portions of of Syria to get them into the uh, western part of the country where they could be employed to uh, to you know defend their interests there or you know pose a threat to um, to Israel so you know this this I this idea of a Shia crescent that you know that uh, that extends from Tehran through Baghdad uh, into uh, Damascus and then on to Beirut I think is is very much a, uh, uh, an idea that Iran has tried to um, has tried to to focus on for quite some time, and of course it's uh, it was made more difficult during the during the campaign, particularly when uh, U.S. forces were uh, working with the Syrian Democratic forces in the uh, in the eastern part of the country fighting ISIS. Uh, it made it very very difficult for that. Uh, I, I uh, Israel has seen the impacts of this, and as 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 everybody has seen has taken more aggressive action in interdicting that uh, but it has not stemmed uh, the intent or the desire of I, of uh, Iran to maintain this corridor of influence and support uh, that uh, kind of links these different Shia communities uh, over which they uh, hold a lot of sway. So it it's very much uh, uh, a current uh, current not more than a concept. It's it's something that they they really desire to uh, to emplace. In addition to Iran's growing influence in the region. Turkey is also becoming quite a large regional power player as well. What do you think Turkey's overall goals in Iraq are? Well, I think there's a variety of things that uh, that Turkey uh, has you know has interests there with. And first and foremost is, as I think everybody knows, they have they have concerns about the about the PKK Kurdish terrorists that operate out of the northern part of Iraq. Um, uh, and who have perpetrated attacks into into um, into Turkey and uh, and added to instability in that in that particular country. So they're they're obviously very very concerned about that and and uh, and and there are operations and there's actually presence of Turkish forces on the ground in northern Iraq that are designed to to address that particular piece. Um, certainly they have interests in in the in form of resources. Um, you know there is a there is a significant pipeline that runs north. Um, out of uh, you know through Kurd through Iraqi Kurdistan uh, into uh, into uh, Turkey and of course they uh, they they want those resources so they have they have interests in that particular area. Um, they also you know there's uh, you know the the two big rivers here the Euphrates and and uh, the Tigris uh, these are these are key sources of water. Um, uh, Turkey has interest in in certainly uh, controlling the flow of that, but it does affect the relationship relationship that they have with the countries that are downstream here and and Iraq is uh, is one of those so water is a is a factor here but but in addition to all of those uh, Ankara you know does have a goal of being a more uh, recognized and powerful regional player so part of their interest is in in developing favorable influence in uh, in uh, 
in in Iraq and and and, and actually more broadly across the across the region. I, I, they do see themselves as a you know kind of a Sunni competitor to uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. They have not necessarily offset that in the region uh, certainly, uh, but they do envision themselves uh, with uh, as as being kind of a leader of the of the uh, of the of the Sunnis uh, in that part of the world. So they have much broader ambitions. Um, uh, besides some of these other, you know, more security resource related interests as well. And what about Saudi Arabia? What are Riyadh's goals here? Well, you know, Saudi Arabia, I think really there, I think there's three things that kind of colors uh, Saudi Arabia's interests in, in Iraq. Um, first is, you know, to kind of pick up on the last uh, uh, part of our conversation here. I mean, Saudi Arabia is the is the Sunni leader in the region and, and all the Sunni, the largely Sunni nations, they, you know, the Arab nations, particularly the Gulf Arabs, look to look to Riyadh for leadership and uh, and direction. And the king plays that uh, certainly plays that role. So, you know, part of their interest is in maintaining favorable balance. Um, it, it's 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 it would be interesting for your listeners to know that, you know, that uh, that Saudi Arabia had broken off relationship. Uh, their diplomatic relationships with uh, with Iraq for some time, reestablished them around the 2016 2017 time frame, and have really uh, focused on that. I, and I and I think the reason they do is they 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 view that a stable um, uh, Iraq is is in is not only in their interest but in the interest of the region in which they are a leader. Um, and they also, of course, see it as a having a good relationship um, with uh, with Iraq. They view very much as a counter to the Iranian influence in Iraq. So uh, I think they look at it very much as a balancing act as well. During the majority of the Cold War, Iraq had pretty good relations with Moscow. Do these ties still remain today? You know, does Baghdad have good working relationships with Moscow? Russia is a uh, is is no doubt is a world actor, uh, and uh, while Russia isn't the Soviet Union, it is it is a it is a powerful country and certainly has a broad interests here that uh, that play out in a variety of of areas. And so I think when you look at at uh, at this relationship and what Russia is trying to do, uh, I mean I think they have some interests here as well. And certainly one of their interests is to is to counterbalance U.S. influence. In Iraq and, and and more broadly in the region, um, you know, uh, it it should be lost on, on none of the listeners here that uh, that Russia's incursion into into Syria to prop up the the Assad regime at a time when it was really on the ropes uh, was uh, was was critical for for. Uh, for the Assad regime, uh, but it was also about entering and, and making themselves part of whatever the eventual solution was in in uh, in uh, in Syria. And so this is the approach of of Russia. And what what I think you see today is you do see some military sales. You see uh, an increase in uh, military to military uh, communication and, and engagements. Uh, I, I was just reading recently about some investments that Russia had made to help uh, the Iraqi military create an intelligence center in, in Baghdad. Um, we do see more investments and activities in the energy sector, um, uh, particularly in the extractions uh, area. Um, uh, so, you know, they have interest in this particular area as, as, as well. Um, and um, uh, so, you know, I, this I think colors colors uh, kind of the relationship there. Um, what I, what I learned in my experience in in, in Iraq and working with uh, a, a lot of their senior leaders is that I you know the Iraqis are in a very delicate balancing uh, position. As I as I noted at the beginning of our discussion, I mean it's a nexus location. Um, it's between the Shias and uh, and the Sunnis. Uh, it sits at the top of the Gulf. It uh, kind of is the hinge hinge point for. Uh, for the Gulf and the Levant, um, and uh, of course, with its linkage into Turkey and everything, it's a linkage into you know into that part of the of the geography as well. So it's an extraordinarily important area uh, over which uh, great powers have contested for a long period of time, and we shouldn't think that that's going to be any different uh, moving forward.
With the US purchasing less and less oil these days, who is Iraq selling the majority of its oil to? Who are the big customers here? Yeah, sure. So, you know, Iraq, really the fifth largest producer of oil in the world, um, you know, exports to a variety of, uh, of actors. Uh, among their top uh, uh, top customers are India and China. Uh, and I was just reading recently, China came across with a, with a big cash advance up front uh, uh, for oil here, which of course, you know, is, is very favorable for the Iraqis because it's, it, uh, they, they are a cash strapped uh, 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 country here. So India and China really are at the top of this about a, about a million barrels per Per day uh, that those countries uh, the, uh, are, are purchasing, uh, and then you see countries like South Korea, uh, very dependent on ex outside exports, uh, uh, exports, um, uh, Greece, Italy, Netherlands. The U.S. is in there. We actually do buy some uh, some oil from them. Israel does as well. So it's got, it's got a fairly diversified uh, uh, group of countries that uh, that buy this, but uh, India, China at the top of the top of the pile. So I think it's fair to say the most complicated relationship right now is the one between Baghdad and Washington. Now, what is that relationship like these days? Well, you know, I, as I as I mentioned a little bit earlier, it's uh, it's certainly been uh, there's certainly been more tension uh, infused into the relationship over the last year as a result of some of our more muscular and aggressive uh, approaches to uh, to Iran, um, and, and uh, so that has induced I think a little bit of tension into the relationship. But I you know I I still think the Iraqis. Uh, look towards the Americans and uh, and view having a positive relationship with the United States and and with other Western uh, Western nations as in their in their long term interests and so you know I, uh, I, I you know that they, while they have to weather these uh, tensions uh, they, they they do have a tendency I think to look long term in terms of relationship and, and would like to have a long term positive relationship with the United States uh, and of course from our perspective the perspective of the United States I mean we, we we really desire a stable stable Iraq it's good for it's good for the region and it would be good for the United States and and for and for many others and of course we don't want Iraq uh, in the in the countries around there being used as platforms uh, for for terrorist organizations who may may perpetrate attacks and uh, we certainly don't want it uh, to be uh, another you know client of uh, of uh, of Iran uh, we want it to be a moderate independent, uh, stable Iraq. And, and, and that's good for the region and it's good for, good for the United States, I believe. With the tensions rising in Iraq, do you think we'll see another group like ISIS rise up over the next few years if we don't do something about it now? Well, you know, I, I think one thing you learn about uh, when you're uh, dealing with terrorist organizations is this is not a threat that ever really completely goes away. So, um, you know, the 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 ISIS caliphate may have uh, may have been defeated here, the physical caliphate, but the ISIS movement remains. And uh, and so you know uh, you know and I think that same thing exists with other organizations. I mean we've uh, Al Qaeda has taken a, a terrible beatdown in 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 not only Iraq and Syria but in Afghanistan and other places. But yet it's still the the ideology the uh, the you know it still remains very very prominent with uh, with them. Their their methods change a little bit. They're much more localized now. They have a tendency to uh, to re build there, trying not to repeat some of the mistakes that uh, that they made in the past by trying to govern and control populations and and control terrain. Uh, but uh, but uh, but we should not think that these organizations um, uh, won't 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 come back. I think one of the mo the the threats that I am most concerned about in this particular region that would have an impact on Iraq and certainly on Syria is the is is the continued uh, presence of uh, of uh, detained 
ISIS foreign fighters in in uh, eastern eastern Syria that are being held that have not been repatriated back to their countries to include being repatriated back to Iraq. This is a long term problem, and uh, the inability to do that, um, I think, are the are the seeds of the next. Um, of the next uh, next group that rises out of this. And I would also point that, you know, I, I think I heard the other day that there are about 10,000 uh, foreign fighters that are in, you know, are being detained in, in eastern Syria and various camps, a lot, many of those controlled by the Syrian Democratic Forces. But frankly, there are much larger uh, displacement camps where ISIS family members and children are growing up. And and the and the numbers are, are quite stark, frankly, in terms of uh, the 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 youthful age of those groups in these displacement camps. The number, of, large numbers of children uh, uh, that are that are there are young adults. And this is uh, again, these are the seeds of the next insurgency. These are the seeds of the next group. And so, as long as these kinds of conditions are allowed to persist, we are going to deal with uh, uh, with uh, with with groups that uh, that uh, you know kind of follow the sine wave of of uh, growth and and uh, and contraction over time. A bit of a hypothetical question for you, but with the benefit of hindsight, if you could go back and change one thing from the past that would dramatically improve the current situation in Iraq, what would it be? Yeah, I think uh, this is a, a really really great question, Michael. And uh, you know, with the benefit now of having stepped back you know out of my own uniform service and looking at this is that um, we have very heavily militarized our policy in this region uh, not just in Iraq but really across the region and uh, and our military as good as it is as professional as it is as and we and we like and we do think of I, I I always think of our military as a force for good that uh, I think we in a region like the Middle East you do begin to see the limitations of, of a military approach to solving these long-term problems and so I think if if I was to go back and change one thing uh, you know I had the ability to do that it would be really making sure that uh, that we created a situation where the military did not eclipse the other elements of power diplomatic power economic power the power of information and our ideas really uh, has to has to has to lead in all of this and uh, and uh, and and that, to me uh, that that would be a really really important fix in this and you know as I as I think about the situation today not just in Iraq but really across the region I, I think from my, from my country's standpoint, one of the really important things we could do, I think, with this new administration is really dedicate ourselves to making sure that we have well resource diplomatic missions in all the countries of the region. It doesn't mean we're going to agree with everything they're doing, but it really provides the platform on which we can have a good candid discussions about our mutual interests and, and how we move forward. And then we use the military and the other elements of power to, to kind of help augment and support that. I, I, think, I think, in my view, that would, that would be a worthy fix. So what went wrong, apart from the questionable border drawing in the first place? Because I don't think anyone wants to open that even worse Pandora's box of talking about redrawing Middle East borders. During the Cold War, the West was fine with the dictator at the helm of Iraq. The country was outwardly stable, and the oil kept flowing freely. We even got to use and encourage Iraq to attack big batches of Iranians, the US's key regional enemy at the time. Is that where we went wrong? By encouraging and arming the Iraqi army to go into Iran? When they invaded Kuwait, the US saw it and needed to act. Worried that Saddam may not stop at Kuwait and instead continue into the Gulf or against major allies like Jordan or Israel. Operation Desert Storm pushed Saddam back over the border, and that should have been it. But all it did was further scare an already paranoid Saddam, who in turn cracked down even harder on his own people, turning up the pressure on the cooker. Is that where we went wrong? Only 13 years later, we once again found ourselves at war with Iraq, 
going to right our wrongs, finish what we started, go in there and knock out the dictator, liberate the people. But all it did was take the cork out of the bottle and start a brutal insurgency that lasts to this day. Is that where we went wrong? So we wanted to rid the people of Saddam's legacy, use the same denazification policies we used in Germany in the 40s, because how could anybody trust the people working for Saddam? So he disbanded his army. We got rid of his staff. We banned them from getting jobs in the area. But that meant that all the experienced bureaucrats who knew how to keep things running, keeping things stable, all left to go work elsewhere. And the only place that would hire them were overseas or domestic extremists. So now the extremists have all the knowledge and all the soldiers, as well as the guns. Is that where we went wrong? The majority of the country is Shia, and they had been oppressed by a small group of Sunnis for years. So logically, it makes sense to have the largest group of the country run the country. But if you've been oppressed and abused for decades, and you're given the whip yourself, it doesn't take much for the newly minted power brokers to turn around to the other group and give them a taste of their own medicine. And ethnic violence kicks off almost straight away. Is that where we went wrong? Allied troops, as well as private military contractors, being there caused huge headaches for the locals. And it's estimated somewhere around 206,000 Iraqis were killed during the occupation. And of course, that would breed resentment amongst the population. Especially if it was your brother or sister that was killed in the crossfire, on the way home from a school by a poorly trained US soldier. So the US should pull out and leave the country to govern itself then. End the occupation. The moment they left though... Groups like ISIS became the strongest actors in the region, occupying huge chunks of land in Iraq and Syria. Should the US have stayed in? Should the US have gone out? Is that where we went wrong? They say when a plane crashes, it's never just one thing that goes wrong, because single things go wrong on the plane all the time. But it's a series of things going wrong, with one often triggering the other. And I feel like this principle can be applied to Iraq. Because looking at each decision that we've made in the country over the last hundred years, it always seems to take things from bad to worse for the people living there. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. This one has been one we've wanted to do for quite a while now, and it regularly comes up in our suggestions from Twitter. This week was a pretty great one for the team here at the show, as we launched the first five-minute summary video on the geopolitics of rare earths, an animated video summing up our entire 90 minute piece in five minutes. So if you wanted to show a friend, give someone an introduction on a topic, or simply you like the animated shorter style videos, pop over to our YouTube or our Facebook and you can check it out now. We'll be doing similar summary episodes each fortnight going through for lots of our classic pieces, as well as some new ones. If you want to find out more about these videos or simply support the show, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, Discord, and Twitter, on the handle at the red line pod or you can find out more about us on the website www.theredlinepodcast.com and if you want to follow me you can find me on the twitter handle mike hilliard oz oz is in australia our new video and this whole show were completely made possible by our amazing supporters over at patreon each of these fantastic people donates a few dollars each month to help us keep the show going and every dollar they spend goes right back into the show our Patreons regularly have one-on-one Zoom calls myself and the team, play Geoguessr and Beer Nights on our Discord, and participate in our group hangout regularly. And I absolutely love the community we build around the show. So if you can spare a few dollars a month, we would be incredibly appreciative to have it, as well as your support. Another big thanks goes out to the guests on this week's panel. James Lieberbick is such an amazingly respected author, and someone who can really lay out the many pitfalls that were present through the multiple Iraq campaigns. He has quite a number of amazing books on the subject, and I recommend you go check those out. Diyar Amin was a great local voice, who not only studies this situation, but has also lived it. The idea of an independent Kurdistan is such a tricky one to cover, and it is much more complicated to understand the regional complexity of something like this than, let's say, a Catalonia. But if you want to keep up to date with what is going on in Kurdistan and where the situation is at, I recommend you follow him on Twitter on the handle at DRM Amin. General Joseph Vodal is probably the highest ranking military member we have had on the show so far, 
and he was the man who helped salvage the situation as it stands today. It is not often you get to sit down with the man who made the big decisions and ask him why, and we're so thrilled to do so. We're looking forward to having him back on the show very soon. As was suggested by one of our Patreons and we've done for the last few episodes, here are our three recommended books if you wanted to dive further into today's topic. The first is Planning to Fail, The US Wars in Vietnam, Iraq and Afghanistan by James Leverbeck. The second is The Iran-Iraq War by Peter Rizzou, if you want to understand how the chessboard was set here. And the third is Black Wave, Saudi Arabia, Iran and the rivalry that unraveled the Middle East by Kim Gaddis. There's almost a kind of cold war kicking off in the Middle East between Riyadh and Tehran, and this is a great explanation on how this problem radiates around the region. As usual, I want to thank my amazing team for all their work on this episode. Mark Spencer has been doing extra voiceover work for us for quite a while now, and we couldn't be prouder to have him as part of the team. He's currently putting together a petition to get Apple to add a climate category to the podcast section so people can more easily find information on how climate change is affecting the world and what we can do to help. It's a great initiative, and if you want to go check it out, you can find more information on his Twitter handle, at Climactic Show. Owen Swift has taken a huge role here at the show, as our producer, a writer, researcher, and redesigning the entire website. The show is making huge leaps and bounds at the moment, and a lot of that is thanks to Owen. If you want to find Owen on Twitter and say thanks for the amazing work he's done on the website so far, you can find him on the Twitter handle at Owen A. Swift. Marissa Rafter has just joined the team as our animator, turning these episodes into short videos, and her first video about rare earths was phenomenal. She brought a complicated topic to life and made it so incredibly encapsulating. She has worked with some of the biggest names in the industry, and now she's working with us, and we're so proud to have her on board here. Joe Hawthorne is the main reason this show sounds as good as it does, and that's thanks to his amazing audio cleaning skills. There is nothing worse than a good podcast with terrible audio, and Joe is the one that stops that from happening here. He's a great dude and an even better audio guy, and if you want to find him on Twitter, you can visit him on the handle at JoeHawthorne77. The last thanks goes out to you for listening to the show. Watching the show get bigger and bigger each month has been nothing but amazing for me. Nothing in the world makes me happier than watching all the comments and feedback coming in the day after an episode drops. So if you ever have a comment about the show, we'd love to hear it. Even when people ask me questions on Twitter or Facebook or Reddit, I really enjoy getting to know all of you and answering all your questions. So please keep them coming. We'll be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Redline podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.